Can an outfielder become a major league pitching ace? Can major league outfielders abandon this race? Can Toronto's Blue Jays stay on their feet? Can Montreal's Expos become harder to beat? Can Lenny Randall find that handle? Can Steve Garvey's four million boats keep the National League streak afloat? Or can Rod Carew's magic bat pull an American League victory out of the hat? Coming up, more headlines and highlights in This Week in Baseball. America's national pastime has moved to Canada, where the fans are really in love with baseball. In Toronto, they waited a mighty long time for the major leagues to expand, and now the young Blue Jays are kicking up more of a fuss in the American League than anyone thought possible, led by rookie manager Roy Hartsfield. Uh, the f <coughs> philosophy of the Toronto Blue Jays, uh, prior to the expansion draft in New York on November 5th, was to uh, uh, go for the younger players. We felt that this was the the ideal way to go, and also uh, if the players were available, to mix in a few veteran ball players to be a stabilizing influence. And uh, uh, we were quite fortunate in that respect. Uh, after the draft was over, we were quite happy with the uh, the players that we got in the draft, and uh, we feel that we accomplished that part of our goal. The fact is, the Jays drafted some players worth chirping about. Otto Velez, selected from the Yankees, got the Blue Jays off to a flying start in April with a hot bat. His power and 400 average made him the league's player of the month. And although he's since come down to earth, Otto has proved he belongs in the major leagues. So has Al Woods, who can run, field, and hit 300. And Doug Alt, who's shown good power, and now he shows the Red Sox he can also bunt. Every team needs a good shortstop, especially the one that can help make the double play like budding all-star Bob Baylor, the Jays' number one pick from Baltimore, a top choice who's been among the league's leading hitters all season. I was fortunate enough to get drafted into the Blue Jay organization, and being the first pick was even uh, more beneficial. There's a lot of young guys and a few old guys mixed in, and we're really thrilled being here, and it's uh, just a great organization so far. The coaches are doing a great job, and... Uh, we're really working good together, surprisingly. Of course, the Blue Jays have got a long way to go to get it all together because very few of their players have had much big league experience before this season, but they're learning fast. And on the field, they're helped out by 39-year-old Ron Fairley. How's the team look to you, Ron? We have a bunch of young players, as has been mentioned several times. We have, I think, 20 rookies. And my job here in Toronto is to play the caliber baseball that I have been playing for the last 17 years and to help some of these young ball players mature and become major league players a little bit sooner. Several years ago when I signed with the Dodgers, I was very, very fortunate in the fact that I was given the opportunity to be associated with players like Gil Hodges, Duke Snyder, Pee Wee Reese. And I said a long time ago that if I was ever given the opportunity to help a young ball player because of the fellows that I've just mentioned that helped me out so much, that I'd certainly pass that information on to them. Ron's been doing fairly well with his bat, which has him among the league leaders in hitting. Fairly shining in the twilight of his career, but for the Blue Jays, the sun is just beginning to rise. Manager Hartsfield is optimistic. Right, Roy? Hopefully that uh, sometime in the very near future uh, that several of our young ball players can blossom at the same time, so to speak, and then take us out of the suspect category and put us into a contending category. The fans in Toronto share this enthusiasm. Only Boston and New York have better attendance records in the league. Yes, Toronto is mighty proud of its major league team. 
So is Montreal, Canada's first big league city. The Expos took root in 1969 and are now rewarding their loyal fans with impressive results. The home of the 1976 Olympics, beautiful Olympic Stadium, is now the home of Major League Baseball in Montreal. The Expos hired manager Dick Williams to put together a contender, and he's been looking to young catcher Gary Carter to provide leadership on the field. The first product of the Expos farm system to make it big in the majors, Carter plays with flair and intensity, a big favorite of the Montreal fans. I really love the city. The people have just been uh, fantastic to us, really. Uh, whenever we go into stores and all, and I am recognized, uh, they're, they're always there for a congratulations or a hi or really a good nature and all. And uh, the involvement that we have, we're, we're going to try and even learn some French and all, because uh, just to be, since they show their inspiration towards me and their likefulness and all, I feel in return I can learn a little bit French and show the same for them. Whether French or English, Carter's bat has been speaking the right language in Montreal this season, and his desire to win has rubbed off on the team. Well, personally, uh, I'd like to accomplish a, a championship here in Montreal. I'd, I'd really like to be a part of a team that, that is a winner. So I, I, I just want to win more than anything. I can taste it. This season, three more Montreal farmhands have blossomed together in the Expos outfield. Warren Cromarty, a solid hitter who makes good contact and can knock in runs. Andre Dawson, good hitter, good fielder, and plenty of speed. And Ellis Valentine, who has speed, power, and almost everything else. There goes a Valentine blast. Valentine is fast becoming Montreal's first bona fide superstar. And many believe that Valentine, Dawson, and Cromarty comprise the best young outfield in the game. To stabilize the Montreal youth corps, the Expos made some trades for experience in the infield, such as Spire to Cash to Perez. A DP combo that sounds like an old hit. Dave Cash leads off with a lot of hits, and Tony Perez drives them home. And Chris Spires stops them at shortstop. The Expos are reaching upwards and are zeroing in on more pitching to become serious contenders. They now have one authentic mound star in Steve Rogers, ace of the staff. With Canadian bred rookie relief pitcher Bill Atkinson now doing a job in the bullpen, Montreal pitching may also soon come of age. One thing is certain baseball is coming of age like never before in Canada. Tuesday night at Yankee Stadium, it'll be the 48th All Star Game, a fan's midsummer night's dream. The game means a lot to the fans. A record 12 and a half million ballots cast this year topped only by a presidential election. The game also means a lot to the players. Ask Steve Darby. For me, the All-Star Game is an ultimate. It's a boyhood dream. It's an opportunity for a young man in America to play professional baseball and then be selected by the fans around the country to represent the National League in what's probably the finest summer classic in the world. Garvey holds the highest batting average of all active players in All-Star play. This will be his fourth All-Star Game. He's yet to lose because the National League has won the last five games. Johnny Bench of Cincinnati has been in all five. He'll be making his 10th straight appearance in the Summer Classic, where he's averaged over 400 and blasted three homers. Experienced players like Bench have given the National League the edge in recent years. And Cincinnati second baseman Joe Morgan adds more experience and talent. This will be his seventh All-Star game. And as everyone knows, the little guy can do it all. Morgan will team up with Cincinnati sidekick Dave Concepcion for the third time. They understand a lot about teamwork, as you can see. The third baseman will be Los Angeles' Ron Say, who can prevent runs and produce runs. This will be the Penguins' fourth All-Star appearance. In addition to a Penguin, a Bull will also be in the National League lineup. 
Greg Luzinski. The Philadelphia outfielder is enjoying one of his best years as he prepares for his third All-Star game. Pittsburgh's Dave Parker is the only newcomer to the National League lineup. The big guy can hit them into the spaces. And he can stop them on the bases. Rounding out the National League outfield is Cincinnati's George Foster, fighting for his second RBI title. In last year's game, Foster knocked in three runs to earn the game's most valuable player award. The American League All-Stars are young and hungry for a victory. One is Kansas City's George Brett. What do you say, George? The biggest thrill uh, is just to go out there because the fans have selected you all over the country and they realize that you're a good ball player and they want to see you represent the American League and to give their uh, hometown a, uh, an edge over the National League. And it's just something that when you're a little kid, you always want to be a major league ball player, but to be an, an all-star is uh, something. And I just hope that I can go out there and show the 1.8 or 2 million fans that voted for me that they didn't make a mistake and I want to help the American League win this year because it's been a while since we've won. Three of Brett's American League teammates will be making their first All-Star appearance. Willie Randolph, Yankee second baseman, a 300 hitter who at age 22 should be an All-Star for years. Shortstop Rick Burleson, the key to Boston's infield. Scrappy, aggressive, and hitting 300. who hits the bullseye in Chicago. Richie Zisk, a National League transplant whose booming bat has boosted the White Sox into first place. The remaining four starters add all-star experience to the American League team. Red Sox catcher Carlton Fisk. Injuries have abbreviated Carlton's all-star chances in the past, but his bat is really robust this year. Minnesota's Rod Carew, top vote getter in the majors with well over four million votes. That's enough to win the governorship of Minnesota. They should at least offer Rod a seat in the Senate if he finishes the year at 400. Rod has always been popular with the voters. This will be his 10th All-Star game. It'll be the 11th All-Star appearance of Boston's Carl Yastrzemski. At 38, Yaz is having one of his finest years ever. Through the years, he's consistently been an All-Star standout. Show him how it's done in the field, too, Yaz. How about that? And New York's Reggie Jackson rounds out the American League. Reggie finished fast in the voting to beat out Boston's Fred Lynn. His all-star record should help the American League cast. In the 1971 All-Star Game, Reggie walloped a prodigious home run that's not likely to be forgotten. That was the last time the American League has won the Summer Classic. With Reggie now in a Yankee uniform, playing before the home crowd at Yankee Stadium, American League fans hope his election might portend a good omen. Well, our crystal ball is sure of one thing. Tuesday night, baseball stargazing will be at its brightest. As we sweep around the bases, here's some bits and pieces from around the major leagues this week. The first one strictly out of left field. Watch. Cub manager Herman Franks calls for a relief pitcher. And here he comes. Wait a minute, that relief pitcher is left fielder Larry Bittner. The Cubs were getting clobbered by Montreal, so they figured they'd do some experimenting. Catcher Steve Swisher says, just remember what Mark Fedrich said. 
a hit's as good as a walk. And Bittner says, yeah, I'll remember that. All right, we'll watch. Bittner getting ready to pitch a fastball. Good control, right on the outside corner. All right, now, Larry, let's see your curveball. Nice windup. Look out! The umpire didn't consider that cricket, not even baseball, and tells Larry that'll cost him 50 bucks. Swisher's flabbergasted. Look, the man's bound to be a little wild. After all, he's the left fielder. The umpire says, I can't help that. He isn't pitching from left field. It hardly seemed fair. A guy makes his pitching debut, gets fined $50, then gets shelled for three homers and six runs in just one and two-thirds innings. Well, I guess next time he'll tell the manager to let the shortstop do the pitching. Catch this one from San Diego. A lazy fly to right. Ed Arm Brister, 100 for the third out. Or so he thought. Now the Reds are all headed for the dugout. He runs in yelling, hey, come back. Who's he going to throw the ball to? Some do come back, but the runner slides into third while the Reds hold a convention. Well, even the big red machine can break down sometimes. From Kansas City, watch this. A fly ball to right center. Amos Otis and Al Collins go after it, but they don't get it. <laughs> and the runner races around to third and says, thanks, fellas, for the triple. Stay awake for this one out in Chicago, where the White Sox are playing the Tigers and Ron LaFleur is on first. First baseman Jim Spencer decides he'll try the oldest play in the book. And watch, it worked. How about that? He's out. The floor will remember that one for a long time to come. Spencer made another play the Tigers won't forget. Watch it now. Line drive. Oh, man, what a play. But things weren't so dandy for Chicago's Richie Zisk. Oscar Gamble ripped a shot right off his ankle that sent a groan through the stands. The Sox were cruising in first place with a nine-game winning streak, but suddenly it appeared that their pennant dreams might be shattered. Fortunately, it turned out to be just a bad dream as Zisk recovered quickly. The White Sox finished the week still holding a surprising lead over Minnesota and last year's Western Division champions, the Kansas City Royals, who have been staying pretty hot on Chicago's trail. George Brett came in to pinch hit in the bottom of the ninth with a runner on second in a game against the Milwaukee Brewers. Brett only needed one swing to send the winning run, racing home for a royal victory. No big surprise that the defending batting champion should get the hit, and no big surprise that the defending champion Royals are finally posing a threat in the American League West. In the American League East, rookie Eddie Murray and the Baltimore Orioles gave the Yankees a big surprise, knocking New York out of first by taking three of four games as Yankee killer Murray drove in 12 runs. That allowed Boston to move into first place for the Orioles, hovering right over their shoulder. Baltimore fans are convinced the birds are in this race all the way. With plays like this from Pat Kelly, New York and Boston are convinced of this. The Orioles are big trouble. And in the National League East, Phil Garner and the Pirates proved to be a lot of trouble for the Phillies. A week before, the Phillies swept the Pirates in Philadelphia to move three games behind the Cubs. But this week, the Bucks struck back, taking four straight in Pittsburgh. Garner did the heavy plundering with three homers and 10 RBIs. Garner kept slashing and pirate runs just kept racing home. And the Phils fell away from the Cubs in the standings while Pittsburgh raced back into contention. The Gillette Special. In New York, the Mets were riding a nine game losing streak when Lenny Randall took matters into his own hands. Wow, that's why they call it the hot corner. Yes, Randall did everything in this game to end that losing streak and earn this week's Gillette Special. Watch, once again, Randall finds the handle. And that one was so good, it warrants another look. 
Watch him now. He just seems to will this catch. Go, Lenny, go. Atta boy. His defense kept the game tied going into the 17th inning when Lenny finally decided to end it all. There goes a drive to deep left field. Going, going, and it is gone. You know, folks, super efforts like that are really a thrill to watch. They can happen anytime, anywhere Major League Baseball is played. Take yourself out to the ball game soon. Goodbye, everybody. Hey.